in this whole passage in Romans that Paul was writing about, he's talking about the law. And the problem is not the law. Don't blame it on the Ten Commandments. The problem is sin that's still in me. And who's going to be in charge, that old man of sin or the Holy Spirit that now lives in you? And whoever you let be in charge is the way you're going to live. Something has gone wrong deep in me and it gets the better of me every time. That's what he's talking about. Do you ever wonder why you just can't do everything like you're supposed to? Wouldn't that be great if you could take a pill and then you would just live your life and do things like you were supposed to? And not have to worry about doing the wrong things? Well, you can. It's called the Holy Spirit. You know, but this whole thing, and I, I won't get into it as a topic for another day, and it would probably bore you anyway, but it's what Bible teachers call that already but not yet. You know, if you're a believer, if you're in Christ, you're already saved, and you're guaranteed eternal life, and, and you have the Holy Spirit in you, that's the already. But the but not yet part is you still live in a sinful body, and you still got to live on this earth. You know, and so, yeah, one day you're going to be glorified and have a body just like Christ, and you're not going to have to worry about this anymore. Because not only will you have the Spirit in you, you'll have the body and the nature to go with it. But for now, we live in this little already but not yet thing. But that's the life of a Christian. And that's why it's so important to be tuned in to the Holy Spirit and let Him live through you. You know, salvation can make you whole. But your mind, your will, and your body, it still, still has a sinful nature in it. But that, that's, that gets off on a different subject. So the question is, what's the danger when you pose like this? You know, what's, what's the danger in it? A couple of dangers I want to just focus on to wrap up this thought. John Wooden, I read this quote today, John Wooden said it this way. He said, your reputation, and, and I know a lot of times you read these quotes from John Wooden, because man, for, I mean, he was a basketball coach at UCLA, y'all know who he was, but man, he was a smart man, and really, really has, has a lot of good insight on teamwork and, and character and things like that. But he said, your reputation, now think about this, li listen to this, because you, you've got to stop and think about it for a second. Your reputation is who people think you are. But your character your character is who you really are. Think about that in light of what we're talking about now. Your reputation, your poser reputation is who people think you are. And why do they think that? Because that's who you appear to be. So that's your poser reputation is who people think you are. But your character, that's what's inside you, that's really who you are, isn't it? But when you pose, which one is getting the most exercise? Which one are you working out? When you pose at school every day, which part of you is getting the most exercise and the most workout? I mean, think about it almost. You've seen these movies of, the, of these girls that, you know, the, 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 the oh, well, y'all wouldn't remember if I could remember her name. The girl that had all these personalities living inside her. It used to be it was a great movie back in my day. Sybil. Oh, that'll freak you out. You know, but... But that, that, that's who we're like sometimes, and it's a matter of what day is it that which personality is stronger and which one comes out. Is it my reputation that I exercise and give control over, or is it the character and who I really am? So which one is it? When you pose, you're building up your reputation. That's what people think about you. But typically when you do that, you do it, you subvert your character and who you really are. You're not living the kind of life that you really are. But hey, all we do is call them like we see them, right? Now last week, I asked the question, we talked about that, when you act one way at home and another way with your friends and yet a different way at church, who's the real you? We don't even know who the real you is. But when you develop a relationship with somebody, and if you get close enough to them, they're going to figure out who the real you is. And they're going to figure out that it's not who you were pretending to be. And then they're going to figure out, yeah, I don't really like you. Because that's not who I thought you were. And sometimes that can be good, and sometimes it can be bad. But you put on this false identity, and we talked about that hypocrisy last week, and being a mask. 
And you're not who I thought you were. Listen to this quote. People don't judge who we are. They judge who we've led them to believe we are. People don't judge who we are. They judge who we've led them to believe. So if somebody's judging you and coming down on you, you know, if the shoe fits. The more time and effort we put into making ourselves look great, the longer and harder to fall when the truth really does come out. So people are going to judge who you lead them to believe that you are. And sooner or later, the truth will come out. It may take a while, but it'll come out. And at some point, the real you has the surface. And here's danger number two. With God, it's already out. He knows who you are. I mean, I kind of inferred that, that we pose before God, but we don't really do. He knows. There's only two people in this room that know the real you. That's you and him. So he knows. You're not posing before God. And that's where we got to be careful. That's really, really where you got to be careful. Got your Bible flipped because this one's worth following along. Flip back to Matthew chapter 7. I think we've touched on this before too. This is one that preachers like to scare you with, I guess, but because Tony Nolan's preached on it before, man, he could flat, flat lay it out on this passage. In Matthew chapter 7, and, and this is kind of wrapping up the Sermon on the Mount. And I always try to put it in the context for you when we refer back to that. You know, Jesus' really first public sermon. And we touched on last week where he took, you know, you've heard that it was said, but, but I say, you know, you've heard that the law said this, but I say, you know, he took the law and made it a matter of the heart. And so that was that sermon. And so as he's wrapping this thing up, he makes these few key points that you need to remember, you know, ask and it'll be given. You know, he talks about the tree and the fruit. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Another great point to what we're talking about in here. You know, you can pose and live this way, but if I don't see the fruit in your life, then are you a believer, really? I don't know it by the way you live. And so he's kind of giving us things and wrapping up this sermon, you know, so as we apply them to our lives. And this is the one that kind of hits home. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. On that day, on that day, that day which is the judgment day, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons and we did all these things and we came to revolution every Wednesday night? Didn't we do that? And then we do these mighty works in your name. And then I will, then I will declare, this is Jesus talking, then I will declare, I never knew you depart from me because you have been posing. That's in essence what he says. So who are you? John 10.10. 10. I've been I've, if, if there's one verse I've hammered in your head for six months, it's been John 10.10. 10, but I've always focused on the end of it. You know, Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it abundant. But let's back up for a minute to the beginning of that verse. Do you remember what it says? The thief comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. The thief comes. Satan would have you to believe that who you are is not good enough. That's what this whole thing is about. This whole thing, this whole discussion, this whole idea that we pose and be somebody we're not. It's because Satan would have you believe that who you are is not good enough because he does not want you to be who God created you to be. You can change who you are. But it's time to believe what God says about you. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life abundantly. And that's 
when you're the real you, that's the abundant life we're talking about. You can't have abundant life when you're pretending to be somebody else. God wants you to live in freedom, not in bondage. Because think about it, that's what is that if that's not living in bondage? When you have to pretend to be something you're not. Galatians 5.1 says, Christ has set us free to live a free life. So take your stand. Never again let anyone put a harness of slavery on you. And that's what we're talking about. Forget about the image that you're trying to create. Forget about playing that game. Stop doing the wrong thing and start doing the right things. Get in this book and let the word of God jump off the page at you. Can God really change your life? Yes, he can. If you will let him. And for most of you, you've already made the decision to do that, but you have to keep slipping back and pretending to be something that he didn't create you to be. Can God really change my life? Yes. And if I'm going to be who I'm supposed to be, then I've got to stop being who I'm not. And listen, I'll listen to this quote. I'll close with this. Oswald Chambers, my utmost for his highest today. This is what he says. The most impossible thing for you is to be so closely identified with the Lord that there is literally nothing of your old life remaining. And so for most of you, that's what the challenge is. If you've given your life to Christ, then live like it. So there is nothing of the old life remaining. God will do it if you will ask Him. But you have to come to the point of believing Him to be Almighty. We find faith not only believing what He says, but trusting Him to do it. See, I think that's part of the problem. We'll say that we believe. And we could debate the semantics of of what, what this word means versus that word. What, you know, we'll say that we believe what Jesus says. We'll say that we believe that Jesus came that I may have life, abundant life. But until we actually live it out, then we don't really trust Him. And that's what He's saying here. We find faith not only by believing what He says, but even more by trusting Him. just a matter of belief. You have to trust because when you trust, you live. And you live the real you. Once we see Jesus and possible things he does in our lives will become as natural as breathing. Because see, what the thing is when I say as natural as breathing because when you pose, there's nothing natural about that. Because you got to work it. When you pose, you got to work it because you got to make up in your mind, okay, who am I trying to get close to today? Do I want to say just the right things and laugh just the right way and, and, and you know, dress just the right way? That's not natural because it's not you. But when you believe and trust and live the abundant life that God created you to live, that's easy because it's you. It's that pill that you take called the Holy Spirit that lets you do that. 